Let's pray. Heavenly Father, may we get into your word to see the word, the message of your love, your truth, your grace in Jesus Christ. We ask in his name. Amen. At the time of Luther, for over a thousand years, the church spoke Latin. Jerome translated the Bible into Latin in the fourth century, and they adopted that Bible as the official Bible of the church. Now what's interesting is Latin was not familiar to the common person. It was spoken in government, at the universities, and in church. So for a really long time, most people could not read their Bibles. It was a foreign language to them. They just didn't understand it. In 1525, on Christmas Day, Luther introduced what is known as the German service. He substituted German hymns for the various Latin liturgical parts. And for the first time, the people in Wittenberg heard the Christmas story in their own language. And there are several reports that people wept. The Christmas story, which is so familiar to us, they had never heard. They had never comprehended. They had never understood. So Luther, when he was at the Wartburg in the early 1520s, he translated the New Testament from Greek into German. And these were some of his rules. He said, I want the German to be the language of the people in the marketplace, of the mother in the home, of the children on the streets. And still today, it is a masterpiece of translation. For the first time, the people could read the New Testament. Now, it wasn't until later, the 1530s, that Luther, who was primarily a Hebrew scholar, got a committee together and they translated the Old Testament. And Luther said, I attempt to make Moses so German that nobody would ever suspect he's a Jew. <laughs> When he got to the book of Leviticus, Luther went to the butcher shop. And he asked questions. What do you call that? What do you call that? What are you doing there? And he used the language of the butcher shop in Leviticus in relation to the sacrifices. Luther felt that if God came down to us as Jesus. If we only know God through knowing Jesus and nowhere else, if God humbled himself to become a man and to dwell among us, we should make the word of God available to people in their own language. Now, it's interesting that even today, the King James English Bible, which is translated way back in the 1600s, that it's difficult for modern English speakers to truly understand, but we hold on to it because it's so beautiful. That's not the purpose of the Bible. The purpose of the Bible is to bring God into your life and into your mind and into your heart so he can do his amazing work. So that was one problem, the language problem. The second problem, and you, you saw hints of it in the epistle lesson I read from 2 Corinthians 3, 
was that way back in the third century, there was a brilliant scholar by the name of Origen. And Origen took that passage from 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6, where it says, the letter kills, the spirit gives life. And he said the letter is the literal meaning of the text. The spirit is the spiritual meaning of the text. Uh, it's called allegory. Uh, some people call it symbolic interpretation. So let me give you a sermon that Origen might deliver on the basis of the Word of God. In 1 Samuel 17, when young shepherd boy David is going out to meet the giant Goliath, he stops at the brook and picks up five smooth stones. Faith, love, hope, peace, and joy. Nowhere does it say that in the text. But that's what they did. They could make the Bible say anything they wanted. And Luther says, no, you have to read the literal meaning of the text. Read the text the way it's given. And oh, by the way, the meaning of all the words in Scripture are the word, Jesus Christ. You know, in John 14, Jesus says, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. If you see and listen and watch and, and learn from me, you're hearing the words of the Father. You're seeing the heart and the mind of the Father in my actions, in my words, in what I am doing. And you're not going to see the Father anywhere else. So read the Bible and look for Jesus. That's the only way to truly understand it. There's no other interpretive technique that enables you to receive encouragement and strength, power and life from the Word unless you learn how to see Jesus in the text. Luther made the comment, he says, whenever I come across a text that is a nut, too hard to crack, I throw it against the rock, Jesus Christ, and it yields the sweetest fruit. Now, in just a minute, I'm going to show you how that works. But the final thing that the church said was, why give the Bible to people in their own language? They can't understand it. Only church professionals can understand the Bible. And the greatest church professional is the Pope. Only the Pope's interpretation of the Bible reveals the clear message and intent of the Bible. Common, ordinary people cannot get to the meaning of the, the Bible. And Luther said, no. He said, it's not the Pope that interprets the Bible. This is a famous Reformation principle, and if you ever get a tattoo, get this tattooed on your arm. Scripture interprets itself. It takes a little bit of technique, a little bit of time, but if you read the Bible looking for themes, it's like a stone skipping across a lake. Bing, bing, bing. And all of a sudden it begins to make sense. I've told you my favorite one is I went to my older brother's farewell sermon and he quoted Genesis 3.15. And then I'm going to give you an illustration from a text you've probably never heard preached. But principle number one is everybody in this world, not just in the churches, but everybody in this world is looking for righteousness, significance, that their life has value, meaning, purpose. Everybody. Anybody you meet on the street this week or you encounter in the store, they're all looking for righteousness. They're all looking for something that makes their life worthwhile. Point number two, 
is everybody in this world, including the people here in church, are seeking to establish their own righteousness. Yes, they hear the message of Jesus and his gift of righteousness, but during the week, when we go to work, we want our boss to compliment us. In our marriage, we want our spouse to assure us we're loved and valued. In school, high school, grade school, even younger, we're looking for the approval of the teacher or our peers, especially in high school. High school is tough on kids because they're trying to be accepted and valued and loved. They don't realize, and this is point number three, ultimate righteousness, complete righteousness, perfect righteousness is only given by faith in Jesus Christ. Okay? You got it? Any of you can preach an amazing sermon. You just point out to people, you're trying to establish your own worth and significance and value. You're trying to give your life meaning and purpose by yourself. You're trying to be your own savior. And the only place you're going to find unlimited, unconditional, undeserved love and righteousness is in Jesus Christ. So there's a very obscure text towards the end of Genesis chapter 29. And you know the story. Jacob comes from a dysfunctional family. You remember how that all goes about, that he steals the birthright from his older twin brother Esau. And he has to leave town because Esau is really upset and he wants to kill him. So he goes off far away to a land and he gets employed by a man named Laban. And Laban has a really beautiful daughter. Her name is Rachel. And Jacob thinks to himself, you know, if I just marry, the, the word in the Hebrew, you'll like this, teenage boys. The word in the Hebrew is she was very shapely. <laughs> And Jacob thinks, if I just marry her, that'll straighten up all the stuff in my life that has been messed up. Well, Laban is quite a bit a shyster, much more than Jacob, who's a pretty good shyster in his own right. And so they have a big feast on the wedding night, and, and Laban promises to give him Rachel, but he sneaks the older daughter, Leah, into Jacob's tent. And she's not good looking. Uh, the text says she has weak eyes. I, I heard one commentator say she's cross-eyed. <laughs> Can you imagine? Jacob is madly in love with Rachel because she's beautiful. And he gets somebody who's not beautiful, who he's not in love with. Can you imagine how Leah must have felt? And then to make matters worse, he also marries Rachel. So the very person who shows you that you're worthless and unloved, that you have no value, is living with you. She's your sister. Well, pretty soon, uh, Rachel doesn't have any kids, but Leah starts popping them out like crazy. And the, the first one is Reuben, which in the Hebrew literally means Look, I've got a son. Now my husband will love me. She actually says that. Now my husband will love me. Didn't happen. So a second son, and his name is Simeon, which, which means uh, to add or to count. Now my husband, God will cause my husband to love me. He'll add that. He'll bring that into my life, what I need so badly. Doesn't happen. Third son, Levi. And Levi, as close as we can tell, means to be accepted. Now my husband will accept me. Do you see what she's doing? She's invested her righteousness into her husband's love, into Jacob's approval. One of the ways we try to make our lives righteous is through our family. 
We think if we have beautiful kids, accomplished kids, if our husband or our wife really appreciates us, wow, that's where it's at. Well, she has a fourth son, and his name is Judah, which means praise. And she says, I have given up on Jacob. This ain't happening. My praise is the Lord. Now, the text doesn't say this, but I imagine that, that Leah has a preview of the Lord as her husband. The place where she should look for real love, real acceptance. The place she should look to be valued beyond her wildest imagination. And let me just end with this. You know, in the Bible, we have God as a king, but God doesn't just want us to be his subjects. We have God as a shepherd, but God doesn't want us just to be sheep. The greatest expression, the strongest expression, the most beautiful expression of God's love in the Bible is marriage. That Jesus is our bridegroom. The most concentrated love in the world, in the marriage relationship, is just but a faint echo, a faint glimpse of God's love for us. God loves us, not because we're beautiful or we're accomplished or because we've done something that deserves his up. God loves us because he loves us. It says that in the Old Testament. He loves us because he loves us. Boy, that's, that's really a strange reason. God is love. And we experience that in our lives every day when we realize that Jesus is not just the good shepherd. He's not just the king of Israel. He's our bridegroom. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, today and always, may we read our Bibles to see Jesus. And may we experience the power of Scripture as we see themes and thoughts reoccurring and always, always pointing to Jesus. The more we learn of him, the more we learn of his love and his gift of righteousness, which makes our lives right, worthwhile, significant, which gives our lives meaning and purpose today and forever. May that happen this day, tomorrow, the next, and all throughout this Advent season. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.